the final Love and Science Seminar for 2019. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Grassi. Uh, he got his PhD in experimental psychology in 2003 at the University of Padova, and his main uh, research topics have been uh, auditory perception and psychophysics. Uh, in the late 90s, he also spent several years in the United Kingdom as visiting scientist at the University of Sussex, working on auditory perception, and from 2006, he's part of the University of Padua. Recently, he actively contributed to the discussion about replicability and replication crisis in psychology. On topic, in 2018, he published an interesting paper on Giornale Italiano di Psicologia, uh, that piece uh, generated a vibrant and still ongoing, I guess, uh, debate with interesting responses by other scientists. Honestly, I can't wait for the next chapter to come out. Uh, replicability and its practical implication in everyday research practices is also the topic of today's talk. So thanks, Professor Grassi. Of course, of course uh, the floor is yours. Uh, okay. Massimo Grassi here. Uh, thank you, Carlo, for inviting me here, and thank you all for being here. So uh, today is going to be like a large overview about what is happening in the last five, no, 11 years now. No, sorry, eight years, let's say. I start from eight years ago. So I start with a brief chronology of the replication crisis. Uh, then I will list some of the endogenous and the exogenous uh, issues that perhaps originated the crisis. Then I will go through the open science responses or I don't like to use much open science uh, like a label, but it's a useful label just to address to this kind of topics, okay? So uh, um, I, well, I will show you some of the responses to the endogenous and the exogenous issues. Then we will look whether open science is perhaps the only future, and then some open issues. So uh, let's start with a brief chronology of the crisis. Uh, 2011, perhaps some of you might know this paper, this is a very famous paper by David Ben, uh, which came out uh, and like raised a very large debate. Why? Because it was demonstrated with six or seven experiments, I don't even remember now, that a stimulus you were going to see in three, years, three seconds time was affecting your behavior now. Okay, so you were kind of predicting the future. Okay. So the future was uh, modulating your behavior now backwards in time. And you might imagine this is like a pseudoscience that came out uh, empirically demonstrated with six or seven different experiments, all significant, and so on and so forth. So large debate after it. So uh, results that do not obey the law of physics, but if you remember in the same period, for example, there was a very famous paper by uh, Amicardi, uh, about the power pose, so you, you see if you were standing like this for a couple of minutes, uh, you were going to be much more powerful uh, in a job interview, you were rising your testosterone levels and so on. So but there were many, let's say, too good to be true results out there. In the same year, uh, this paper came out, came out, perhaps you know it, it's one of the most downloaded papers in the last few years, uh, that basically demonstrated that they're starting from nothing, uh, you can demonstrate everything, okay? Um, we just common practices that we use in the lab, just remove one subject, remove one condition, do this, do that. So just by using common practices we use every day in the lab, you could demonstrate and find significant results uh, in any way you wanted to, okay? So very same year. And then in 2015, uh, the first large empirical effort to see whether actually we were producing good or bad science. So uh, this is the Open Science Collaboration paper that came out on, si on science in 2015. All the group was led by uh, Brian Nozick, and perhaps you know this paper here. They sampled uh, 100 different studies in the literature, and they tried to replicate uh, um, directly these studies. And, uh, uh, the general outcome of the, uh, this mega re replication enterprise was that only uh, 39, just about 30, 36 percent of the original results were replicated. Then the, the, there is an issue about uh, 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 which criterion you can use to understand whether something is replicated or not. But let's say that very few studies were replicated. Okay. Uh, this is another uh, um, 
paper uh, assessing the temperature of the field, so kind of giving an idea of what's going on, whether the results that are out there in the literature are, we can trust them or not. And this is a, a paper by John John Edis in, of 2017. This is just a statistical meta-analysis. You just check for numbers and, che and check whether these numbers have any sense at all. And it looks like that there are two large effect sizes in literature. And statistically speaking, there is the large, uh, a very large possibility that much of the literature is a false positive. Okay. And this is yesterday. Okay. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, this is a tweet by Chris Chambers. Uh, yesterday came out of the Many Labs Four, which is a, again a large empirical effort to replicate research. Uh, led by this uh, again by Brian Nozick and several other teams. Uh, I don't remember exactly because I, I didn't have ten, the time to check the paper, but I don't remember exactly what they are replicating. But they are replicating a common topic in, in psychology, several different labs, results zero. Okay, so no replication of the original effect. Uh, there is a nice meta analysis, and actually, if you look at the effect size, you find both positive and both negative results. So uh, the total result is zero. How big is this replication crisis? Uh, okay, so we have meta analytical data, statistical data, empirical data that suggests that there is a large crisis in psychology and neuroscience too. Uh, however, uh, but we might even forget about how big is the iceberg. Uh, we are now aware of several malpractices that are unfortunately very common in our everyday life, uh, everyday laboratory life uh, and uh, science life. And let's say that uh, all these papers and several other ones uh, help to understand how we can improve the current situation somehow. So let's go uh, to the possible origins of the crisis. Here I list uh, two interacting processing. Uh, I list them in series because I cannot list them in parallel, but actually they are working in parallel. So on the one side we have uh, uh, ex endogenous origins of the crisis, and on the other side we have exogenous origin of the crisis. Uh, exogenous and endo endogenous if we take uh, the scientist as the point of view. Okay. So endogenous origins, what we do bad is that we use questionable research practices uh, and in particular p-hacking and hacking these are the major ones so p-hacking you normally read this label somewhere in the literature means like looking actively for a significant result in your data okay so you collect your data start analyzing your data and look for the result really uh, actively look for the result so start to start you start to remove one subject you do this you do that and so on and you look for a positive result you spend something like three months collecting your data and you want a positive result somehow harking uh, uh, means rewriting your hypothesis after you have seen your results so you start with a clear hypothesis in your mind i predict this result here <coughs> then you collect your data your data, unfortunately, do not support your hypothesis, but no worries. In the literature, there are like several and several dozens of papers that can give you alternative hypotheses. So you pick one up and you just rewrite your hypothesis and your data fit your hypothesis very well this time because your hypothesis was created after you collected your data. So possibilities of, yeah, there are several possibilities. Uh, there, are, there are now out there uh, uh, several list of p hackings action you can do actually you can use the you can exploit them to create better results if you like uh, so you mm, we start from adding or removing uh, data points for example uh, adding or removing one or more participants adding or removing one or more dependent variables adding or removing one or more independent variables perform multiple analyses uh, on the same data until you find a significant result. The problem here is uh, that with all these possible degrees of freedom, uh, you have several paths. So you start from here, and actually you open several paths in front of you. Uh, you increase uh, your 
um, possibility to find a type 1 error because of course at some point you might come across a positive result just because you were dropping a coin several several times okay uh, harking uh, this is a oh, perhaps now old paper by Fanelli which uh, Fanelli checked the literature and check it whether in the papers, in the paper we are publishing, uh, the results fit with the hypothesis which is written in the paper. So basically, it was just reading the paper, reading the hypothesis, matching the, uh, looking at the results and see whether there was a, a, a matching, a good matching between hypothesis and results. And guess what? 90% of the published papers show uh, results that support the hypothesis. Okay? 90%. Which means, uh, in my, uh, uh, from my point of view, that it's pointless to run empirical research at all. Because if we are so good at guessing, uh, uh, because we produce so good hypotheses, and uh, our success rate is 90%, why should we have to run empirical research at all? We should just ask a scientist to produce hypotheses, and we will have just an error of 10%. Fantastic, no? And actually, perhaps there is more the chance that people are just looking at the data and find a nice narrative that fits with the data, rather than stick with the original <laughs> hypothesis. Uh, other endogenous origins, okay? Statistical issues. We run experimental small numbers. Uh, the model statistical, uh, the model N in psychology is 15, 15 subjects for a psychological experiment. So we have, generally speaking, low power, okay? Uh, not enough petrol in our car to reach exactly the point we want to, we want to reach. Uh, there is a very large tendency in the literature at, uh, on interpreting the results as true or false, okay? Uh, we are working uh, on, a probability, on a probability level, but actually when we read our results, we say that they are either true or false, okay? So, uh, we read in a kind of binary way our results, although actually there are several nuances in our results. For, so for example, in, in many cases we uh, write the effect size where we never discuss it. Okay? Um, we are building a science uh, on several assumptions, and one of these assumptions is that, uh, for example, psychology or neuroscience is a science because it's replicable. But actually we never run direct replication, so we don't know whether it is replicable or not. Where, for example, in physics, uh, several people were replicating the experiment by Galileo Galilei dropping uh, uh, masses from several towers in Italy, for example, okay, if you like. So, uh, uh, we believe we are doing science, but actually we never tested whether we were doing science or not. And some people suggest that there is a lack of strong theories. So, we have actually... Um, a theory which is in the majority of time data driven, we are not building much theories. And uh, if any hypothesis is plausible, any result can be explained. So if we are not building large theories, of course, uh, uh, theory can be adapted to your own needs, if you like. So there is always uh, in the literature something uh, that might be good for you for explaining your results, or for example, something that can be interpreted in a way or in another way, and so on. So we have very weak theories in general. Exogenous origin is not just a, a, the bad scientist, it is also a bad environment. Uh, publication bias, what happens if you send a null result to a journal, they say, okay, I'm sorry, we do not publish null results, okay, we want the positive result. So uh, out there, there is a publication bias and journals, generally speaking, not all of them, but the majority of them tend to publish, uh, publish only positive results. And then, of course, uh, uh, you are all young here in this room, uh, when it comes to your CV and you want to apply for a job and you want to show that you have a good CV, what do you need to have in your CV? A lot of uh, good publications, okay? So, you know, everybody knows the motto publish or perish, but it's even worse than this because it's published a lot, gets cited a lot in prestigious journals, or perish, okay? So, for example, actually in the last few years we saw uh, an extinction in psychology in Italy because there were, up to a few years ago there were something like 10, 12 people studying history of psychology, now there is just one left, okay? 
because of course you might imagine that history of psychology is a topic which is which is not so fashionable uh, these people are not producing so many papers and they are not definitely cited a lot so just a few examples uh, publication bias to the extreme this is current biology current bio biology is publishing your results only if they are important so if they are not important please go somewhere else okay uh, it doesn't matter whether your research is done uh, well, uh, with a lot of attention and so on, it is important that you have results, okay? Uh, and this is publisher parish in Italy by law, okay? So we have actually numbers, uh, we, have, we have to produce a, cer uh, a certain number of papers per year, uh, we have to receive a certain number of citations per year, we have to accumulate a certain number of citations and so on if, you want, if we want to apply for a professorship, for example, at any level. So we actually we have uh, levels that we need to reach by the end of the year or by the end of three years, then I don't remember anyway. By law, if we want to apply for a professorship in, in psychology, for example, uh, we need to have a certain number of publications, we, we need to have a certain number of citations and so on. So, uh, uh, actually, uh, the system is asking us to produce a lot of uh, uh, publications. Uh, and, and this is pretty much the idea, no? You, you come into the lab, you work, and l let's, let's forget about whether it's conscious or unconscious, you use questionable research practices, uh, you obtain positive results, these positive results guarantee you a publication, and you've got job points, okay? And this is a circle that can go on and on forever. Of course, you might be like a, a naive person and you might not know this questionable research practice. And this works fine, but also you can exploit this. And so you might know perfectly well questionable research practices, obtain very good positive results, for example, uh, that guarantee you a very high quality publication and they give you very good jobs also. Okay, so this can also be exploited in a way. So, uh, 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 and depending whether you are conscious or unconscious about the questionable research practices, uh, this circle changes somehow uh, into a very bad or simply bad uh, circle. And this is like a circular thing, okay? So, uh, what are... Am I going too fast? No. Okay. Uh, what are the responses that uh, people are, or possible actions against these problems, okay? Uh, questionable research practices, in particular p-hacking and arcing. Uh, I know that Chris Chambers was here two weeks ago, one month ago, something like this. Uh, a, I'm sure he gave, you, he gave you a talk about a registered report, uh, which is the uh, motto of Chris Chambers, but in, in any case, uh, in many circumstances, we limit questionable research practices by, practices by asking scientists to state before the research what they are going to do, okay? And this is, for example, pre-registration. You state before your research what you are going to do. You write like a kind of document, open type of document. I want to do this. I've got this hypothesis. I'm going to, to collect this data. Uh, I'm going to run this type of analysis, you put it in the Open Science Framework website and you leave it there for the future, okay? Uh, the pro is that you increase the awareness on questionable research practices. So, for example, my suggestion to uh, 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 PhD students is to run pre-registration, even from just for yourself, so even if your PI doesn't want to uh, pre register anything, do it just for yourself, then just write the document as carefully as possible with what you expect, what you are collecting, and blah, blah, blah. Put it in the drawer, forget it, and then collect your uh, numbers and check whether, for example, your predictions were good. Uh, of course, in contrast, it is very easy to deviate from the plan with pre registration. Uh, registered report is a very different thing. Perhaps uh, uh, I'm sure Chris Chambers was talking a, a lot about registered report. Uh, 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 rather than discussing with yourself and your colleague, you will discuss with the journals and the reviewers about what you are going to do, okay? And when they say go, you are ready to do your research, you go. Uh, uh, for science, uh, uh, I see just positive things about registered reports. Of course, in contrast, the problem with the registered report 
uh, uh, is for publishers. So imagine, for example, if Nature, which is the most prestigious scientific journal in the world, uh, uh, was accepting a registered report. He was facing the possibility to publish a lot of null findings, findings, if you like. Okay. So, and of course, uh, in many cases, journals, scientific journals, are products, uh, and because they are products, of course, it, at the very top level, it is very difficult that they accept a uh, registered report. But this is just a problem for the publishers and not for us. Okay. Uh, so here is in the last few years the number of uh, free registration. Uh, this is an old data, uh, an old graph. I'm sorry, I didn't update it. Uh, the, the number of free registration in the Open Science Framework web website was rising every year, and also the number of uh, uh, journals offering registered reports is now more than 200, if I remember well. Uh, this is 2017, there were only 88 now in 2019. I think we are well over 200, if I remember. Uh, all the actions you might take to limit questionable research practices, sharing, of course, sharing your data, for example, uh, and is also becoming a diffuse practice. Uh, in, many in many cases, journals, for example, ask for your data submission. For example, plus one, just to give you an example, but several other ones ask you for data when you submit the paper. Actually, it's very funny because in the case of PLOS One, if I remember well, they ask you for the data, but they don't check whether you put the data somewhere or not. So that you have just to flag whether you have uh, uploaded your data, something like this. But in any case, I mean, it's be it is becoming like a practice. But of course, uh, you might share more things in order to increase the transparency of your progress. So show to other people that what you did is exactly what is written in the paper. So sharing the analysis script, sharing the materials, sharing the experiment script, and so on. So for example, uh, uh, the Royal Open Science, this is a paper we published last year, and in this paper, we attach to the paper everything, like uh, uh, data scripts, uh, sorry, data, uh, 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 R scripts for the analysis, uh, MATLAB scripts for the experiments, uh, everything is there. So, and actually this is nice, and, and let's example of Open Science, this journal here, because uh, even reviewers' comments are open, in the sense that you, know, you can go there and check uh, all the debate between us and the reviewer. The paper is not nice, but it is nice to format, <laughs> okay? The paper itself is not such a good thing, okay? Uh, Small n, we were talking about small number of participants in psychological experiment. It is still pretty much like this, but the number is likely rising. Of course, I have not the temperature of the thing. I cannot measure it. It's difficult to measure the, uh, the, the number of participants now in papers. But for example, now there are like um, kind of large efforts for recruiting several and several uh, laboratories, uh, participants together, thanks to the collaboration of several and several laboratories. So for example, here you see a call for replicating the very famous experiments by Ben, which I, sh I was showing you at the beginning. This is the Psychological Science Accelerator, which is like a kind of hub. Uh, you can register there and uh, uh, participate into very large data collection. So there are several laboratories working together to collect uh, uh, data for the same research. Uh, bad Udo statistics. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, uh, we still have very bad statistics, okay? Uh, we still report a lot of FXIs that we never discussed. We fill the paper with FXIs, but it's difficult to see anybody discussing results uh, uh, in terms of FXIs. Uh, and it's still very much like discussing your results like they are true or false. Um, and in my opinion, there is a lack of statistical culture within the psychology and neuroscience community. Things are kind of growing in the sense that, for example, if you go to the methodological session, in the conferences, now the number of people participating into this session are, is larger, but I mean, it's a slow progress. So it's not such a fast progress in the end, in my opinion at least. Uh, we were discussing that the, we never run the replications, now replication exists. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, I didn't find this, date, uh, this datum for psychology or neuroscience. Uh, this is empirical economics. So uh, this line here is showing the number of replication in empirical economics, okay, which is growing, which means that in, in also in, in related fields is growing, and which means that we are now running replications, okay? What is the problem? 
Uh, the problem is that we don't know what replication means. So, for example, we are going a bit baroque here, in the sense that, for example, uh, 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 this experiment here is a reanalysis of one of the replications by now. Sorry. Uh, uh, in any case, uh, there are now replications of the replications. So, uh, so you run a replication, you do not observe the same results they observed at the beginning, so you rerun the replication, and now there is a kind of battle between the original results, the middle results, the end results, and so on. Uh, um, this paper came out two weeks ago, which is basically similar to the paper by Simons and Simonson, which was showing that you can obtain any results by manipulating uh, your data. Um, mm, here they suggest that actually you can also produce null results uh, uh, by manipulating your data. So you can produce positive results, but also negative ones if you want to. So in general, uh, the pro uh, on replication, uh, there is a large issue here in my point of view. Uh, we still have to understand what replication means. But first of all, when we are replicating some, somebody or a research, it is still unclear exactly what you have to replicate. Uh, what are the key points we have to replicate, or what are the key points you can, or the, the, the non-key points you can kind of ignore, uh, and so on. And then again, at the end of your replication, when you see the results, and you have to compare your results with the original ones, okay? Uh, we still do not know or do not have a meter to understand what, uh, how we can compare things. So uh, we have to look for the same significant results. We have to look for the same significant, same effect size. Uh, we have to contact the original author and ask them whether our, uh, the results were certificated or not. Or we might, for example, uh, ask several experts on the field and uh, ask them to judge whether the result has been replicated or not. Several possibilities to judge whether something is replicated or not. But in general, what is the problem with replication uh, is that now our, our experiments are very complex and therefore it's not like black or white. You replicate it, you didn't replicate it. It's more like 50 shades of grey, if you, if you prefer. So there is always something in the middle, something which was barely replicated, something not much, and so on. A very complex issue, uh, issue in the end. Uh, so for example, it's even difficult to replicate the same results starting from the same data set. This is your science, 70 different groups running their own pipeline on the same data. So one data set, 70 different groups that analyze this uh, uh, data set and results that unfortunately are often very different from group to group. Of course, all these groups were using different pipelines for analyzing the data, but they were starting from the same numbers. Okay, so same number, different results. So you might imagine that uh, understanding whether we replicate or not is definitely a complex issue. Uh, lack of theory, uh, not much on this side in my point of view, and uh, I think that, for example, now we have the first uh, numbers about the success rate of registered reports in, term of, in terms of uh, number of papers that found results supporting the original hypothesis, uh, and this number is very low. So this means, in my point of view, that if the hypothesis was a sol sound solid hypothesis, Perhaps this means that our theory is not so strong in the sense that it's not generating good hypotheses. Uh, we are generating bad hypotheses, and of course, when we uh, are in the context of registered reports and observed results, and these results do not match our hypothesis, this means, in the very end, that we started from a very bad theory, or very bad data, if you prefer. Okay? Uh, Responses to the exogenous problem, publication bias. Okay, now we have open access publication, which is like a kind of door to escape publication bias. Uh, uh, open access journals are still young, of course, because if you if you imagine like PLOS One was introduced in the market only 12 years ago, so still perhaps too early to understand whether open access publication is going to uh, uh, modulate the publication bias, in my point of view. Uh, and of course, 
publishing nothing, so if you run a research and you find really nothing, it's really hard for yourself to go out with a paper that says, hey, I found absolutely nothing, okay? Uh, it's more rewarding normally to find a positive result for everybody. Uh, but you see that, for example, this, this is just a quote from PLOS ONE, the journal publication criteria are based on high ethical standards and rigor uh, of the methodology. So, in theory, PLOS ONE doesn't care, for example, about whether uh, your results are positive or not, whether you, there is completely nothing in your data or not. There is just emphasis on the method, which is very different from the claim that, for example, current biology was making. Uh, this is even more, this is a new journal by uh, Cambridge, uh, Experimental Results, which is a, it was launched in August um, uh, this year. And actually, the idea of the journal is uh, to take out from the drawer all those research and data that are in the drawer because, for example, uh, they were not good enough, uh, not good enough to go on a publication, like the fourth experiments or four of a long series of experiments that didn't fit with the, the, the three previous ones. So everything that is basically uh, normally in your drawer. I mean, the idea of the journal is to uh, uh, open your drawer and put the results in, the, in this journal. And this is actually a door to avoid the publication bias. Reward, so uh, about the pu uh, publish and perish, uh, um, there is not much, uh, for example in Italy unfortunately you still have to publish um, a certain number of papers per year, have a certain number of citations per year and so on. Uh, in other countries things are slightly changing so you might see some job call which is stressing whether for example you were using some open science, uh, science practice or so on and so forth. Uh, uh, difficult really to have an idea, uh, 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 an idea of what's happening now in the world. Of course, for example, uh, 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 the panorama in, in Italy is very clear, but if you just move to Holland or the United Kingdom, you might find some differences there. Uh, and of course, we know uh, we are actually following uh, the dictate of our uh, uh, law. So, for example, Italian scientists are uh, very famous for self citations because, of course, uh, if you think about all the criteria to become a professor in Italy, two out of three uh, rely on the number of citations. So, if you increase self citation, you boost all your numbers. Uh, a very easy way to boost your numbers. We are increasing the number of citations, sub citations. Um, uh, okay, uh, is open science the only future? Uh, I, is the future I prefer, but it's actually not the only future. So, if you, for example, this is a research run by Elsevier. Uh, Elsevier asked uh, several scientists, they made a research to understand how science is going to be in 10 years' time. One of the possible outcomes is open science, so one of the possible scenarios of open, open science in 10 years' time. Uh, unfortunately, there are other possible scenarios. You see here a dragoon, which means uh, a fast rise of Chinese research, uh, uh, which means no open science at all, if you like, um, because of course. But, uh, fortunately for us, or at least for me, uh, um, uh, China is not interested in psychology yet. Uh, but they are much interested in several other fields, so they might, they might touch neuroscience soon. Uh, I start to see some Chinese papers up there, I mean, Chinese authors from uh, Chinese uh, uh, universities and so on. And we might, if we exaggerate everything, uh, we might think that, the, we might suppose that in 10 years time, perhaps uh, all the future uh, sci uh, science might be Chinese, and of course, who knows, whether uh, uh, open uh, will still be a, a word that we might support in the future. Uh, open issues. Uh, what should we do in a sorted order? In my opinion, we should publish less and increase the quality of publication. This, we, uh, this would be like a very first step. Uh, I would do this. I would like to do this also because it's very difficult to publish a lot of papers. Uh, we should increase our statistical culture. Unfortunately, for several uh, decades, we went on running the same three or four analyses, uh, t-test, ANOVA, and correlation, and a couple of linear regression, everything, and, and that was it, okay? Uh, 
Uh, by the way, I would actually to increase our statistical culture. Uh, we have to still to understand what replication means in psychology and neuroscience, uh, which is an open issue. Uh, but in general, we have to accept variability. Uh, so, so far, in my opinion, we were interpreting results are true or false. And this was a limitation in our everyday behavior as a scientist. And we have to work on theories, of course. Hopefully, our institution should ask us to produce less papers or not ask us to produce a certain number of papers per year, which is really bad in the sense that uh, uh, it's like having you know, the, the horse and the carrot in front. Uh, so you have to run after the carrot. Uh, I don't know whether the things are changing here in Italy. I don't think Ambro is changing anything at the moment. Uh, we are still there. We'll see in a, a few years' time. And this is it. Questions? There are kind of nuances. Uh, everybody has got his favorite one. But <laughs> right. Right. So, um, Anita, you were stressing that you know, compared to current biology, for instance, uh, they don't stress too much on the novelty of the, of the findings of the paper, but on the uh, sound methodology. Right. Um, so, uh, I'm not sure about that, in the sense that they might stress that, uh, but not in, in the sense that you it's not that they ask you to do a digital report. No. You know, they they are very used for this for this journal, and actually, what is really hard is it's for years is the is is work, right? You know, you, you are, it's, it's hard to reject a paper, right? You, know, you have a hard pressure for uh, not rejecting it, but collaborating with the author to make it uh, better. That to some extent is is good, but certainly, okay, I mean, certainly, too, in my opinion, you have a much better check of the method. In a classical way, in current biology, than in plus one. Uh, in current biology, so papers published when they were comparing 10 against 10 group of participants for a treatment, uh, which is really bad, in the sense that, mm, <laughs> uh, and they were proposing a treatment which, which was really weak. I mean, uh, I, I, mean I, just, I just reviewed it. I mean, if you want to go like, you know, cherry picking on the ah, okay, paper, okay. I just reviewed the paper in, in plus one and that uh, had a, you know, this sample uh, size. Just uh, yeah, you know, my my impression is not so positive uh, in the um, for, for for this journal. Then I, I mean I agree with mm -hmm. everything you you have said. Maybe that is 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 the part that I that I myself to be uncomfortable to to think yeah that, that plus one. Is yeah, no, uh, 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 I don't know why I tend to like plus one, but I I totally agree with you in the sense that uh, yeah, there is no good journal. I like it. there is no mm. the good. Journal. I mean, uh, in fact, actually, there are people that are suggesting to drop journal at all. So, for example, some people are suggesting just to use Psy Archive, for example, and to put everything there and forget about the publisher, yes. uh, which would be a, a good idea. I mean, uh, uh, then, then it's going to be possible to do this. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so, so, so there are some authors suggesting this. I, I, I kind of understand because, of course, uh, uh, for example, that sentence is written on plus one, but it's not of course, uh, the opinion of the editor, or might not be the opinion of the reviewer. Okay, So when it comes to the editor and the reviewer that are judging the paper, it might be possible that they ask you, oh, where is the possible, where is the positive result here? I want to see positive results. Oh, no, 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 I mean, they, they can also publish uh, positive results that maybe are not theoretically uh, grounded. Whatever. And, that, and that it's fine, but that my impression reviewing for this journal is that you as a reviewer, you don't have a stronger pressure compared to other journals in checking that the, the methodology and the statistics and everything is it's, it's perfect. Whereas you know you send it to uh, current biology and 
usually reviewer are much more strict there, right? You know, they say the reviewer are always the same. Okay. Yes, uh, you are, you are, <laughs> give an answer to that. I mean, uh, yes, you are right, definitely. But the point is, probably, is related to the reviewer. When you review a paper for time, is very precious. And with yeah, sure. When you review a paper for close one or scientific report, whatever, you say, okay, yes, fine, I review it, but I'm not going to be so nasty because the journal is not so high level. If you review a paper for current biology, nature, neuroscience, whatever, you are going to be very uh, nasty on what you uh, ask in something. You check for every single comma. That is probably the general approach. Even if then the quality of the papers sometimes is not much different. It's exactly easier. Yeah. Did you ever get to the ruling process? Yes, that's, that's the point. point. Yeah, but that, that, that was not a defense. My, my was not a defense on current biology. It was more an attack on uh, a journal like Plus One uh, Frontier. I mean, I mean, work that they stress a lot, you know, they, they need to be in methodological design, business. but they, they do nothing for pushing a little bit the reviewer to, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, to, to review it. And that is my experience in a different way than you review any other uh, paper. If you want to be more picky, analysis or uh, to you know share the data with me and I mm -hmm. go through your analysis and but if you don't want yeah, yeah. the problem is the impact factor that's the problem uh, so the higher is the impact factor uh, then the journal uh, well <laughs> but in any case if you compare the IQ of blonde and brown hair and you go on current biology see you Look, there is no difference. I got a huge sample here, like uh, all the world population. They say, who cares? Okay, so uh, you have to show results in the end. I mean, uh, at the moment in current biology, like in the top journals in general, you have to show results. So something which is really strong. So even with the strongest methodology, if you come out with a result which is nothing, uh, I'm sorry, I think you have to change the journal. Uh, I totally agree with you that there is no the, at the moment, there is not like the perfect journal uh, for several reasons. There are no perfect journals, there are just imperfect journals for several. For, so for example, we were discussing in Padova with a biologist, they were suggesting to go for uh, journals like uh, the Royal Society Journal, which belong to uh, scientific societies. Because at least in the end, uh, on the background of the journal, there is no like a super profit company. This might be an option, but of course, in the very end, there are editors, there are reviewers, there are authors. So uh, we might criticize the journal, but the journal is made by editors, reviewers, authors, and everything. So, uh, and it's us. So it's us that have changed, <laughs> I think. So it's not the journal. The journal is just a box. And of course, uh, I'm saying in some cases, there are special journals. I'm just, yeah, I agree. I'm just wondering. But at least, uh, uh, if you look at the, uh, the website of the journal, there are some journals that, in theory, uh, should do this, and in theory, might behave in a different way. So, uh, at least theoretically speaking, journals present themselves in themselves in a different way. It's one of the problems, of course. But then, okay, again, the fabrication system is very different. Is there so, for example, uh, we have mm, 
you all are receiving those emails from these paid journals, mm -hmm. for example. Okay, we start from that, and we arrive to uh, I don't know where exactly because, for example, we might have good open science journal, uh, go, go open open access journals, fairly good. I mean, for example, there are new journals like uh, in psychology that. Uh, in a couple of times it would be nice to check whether they are good or not. For example, there is Collabra, which is a new enterprise for psychology. Uh, uh, publication speaking, I, I agree. Uh, uh, I didn't stress much, but because there is, in my point of view, there is no... Uh, I don't see like a very good journals and very bad journals. There is good and bad things all over the place. In, in, in particular, uh, uh, I mean, you can, you can find bad things in open access journals, you can find bad things in traditional journals, but also the reverse. Uh, so, in the end, uh, I think that it's easier to start from base and uh, 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 start to think our work in a different way, so that when we are reviewer, when we are editors, we act in a different way too. Yeah, some data are. So I, in my opinion, some data are. <laughs> no, not all data are equal, in, in my opinion. There are some, some more important data. Uh, so, some data, in my opinion, move science more than other data. Uh, uh, then, of course, uh, uh, we, we, um, I mean, this is a, my, my strict opinion. Uh, but then again, um, at, at the moment, uh, I suppose we agree in the sense that at the moment there are. Um, journals that do not care about the quality of your methodology and if you have just a, a stretch of data that really looks interesting, uh, let's publish it. And who cares? We we'll see in the future. Uh, I got a comment, you shared a slide where Italians are citing themselves more, mm -hmm. but actually I mean, the story is slightly different. See. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, we are catching up with others. Yeah. <laughs> and the second aspect, that, that increase started when uh, most of the Italian journals were, uh, that were not ranked before in international database, from that year on, uh, they were ranked. So the story is not completely true. Mm. Uh, but um, I'm going to just very, if, let's say you got the chance to take one action, just one what would you do to improve this situation? Education. That's the important, to adjust education. Education. <laughs> Everything starts on the base. In my opinion, I mean, this is going to be a very long process, like every crisis in science. I mean, you cannot act top-down, I suppose. It's just, but, I, mean, I mean, you can, of course, uh, push something, address things, but if you educate well people uh, in doing science, in the end, if you think about uh, me, you, for example, we are from a generation that we are going to the laboratory, okay, this is the machine, collect the data, analyze which are the analysis, this and this, okay, there is the anovan, or you might use the t-test if you have two variables. <laughs> so it was like a simple recipe, like, uh, but of course, uh, we, what we understood is that it's not a simple recipe. Uh, it's more complex, uh, it's more difficult, okay. We start again. If you think about, for example, when we started psychology or studying psychology or neuroscience, if you like, a Bund, okay? Uh, at the beginning of 150 years ago, Bund was asking the subjects to describe what they were looking after, for example, describing this sensation. And in 40 years' time, we understood that this method was wrong. Uh, and there was the paper by Watson saying, okay, Bund is stupid, I'm not going to use the introspection in my papers any longer. And uh, there was the beginning of behaviorism. So if you look from very far away, this is just a new crisis of science. Uh, in a few years' time, at some point, uh, we are going to adapt to a certain standard, which is going to be different from now, uh, different from the standard we are using nowadays. I don't know exactly what it's going to be. Mm, it's going to take a few years, in my opinion.
Yeah, I agree. In fact, uh, actually, if you think about it, now in several groups, uh, you have the writer, you have the person which is uh, programming the experiment, yeah. you have the statistician, and one which is good at uh, writing the discussion, usually. Uh, so this is the, like, uh, the, the dream team you might <laughs> want to have in your laboratory. Um, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps in the future science, uh, uh, of course now science is a social enterprise, so I agree with you that we all need a statistician in our lab. Mm -hmm. uh, they, have, they have a huge number of people in, involved in each paper because they need several, several like, skills to, to, to run their experiment. And maybe in psychology we tend to want like, just to be two or three on the paper where it's not realistic to have all the skills required for the paper. I agree, I agree. I, I suppose that in the future perhaps uh, all groups will have a kind of statistician uh, in the lab. N for example, now there is Wagenmakers which is supporting the idea of uh, blind statisticians too. So no statistician working for the group because of course mm -hmm. if you know the hypothesis, if you know the data, if you know what you are working on, you might be tempted to do this, to do that. Even like in a nice way if you want to. But of course there is like a, an effect of the fact that you know what you're doing on the way you analyze your data. Uh, and it is possible in a few years, and it, it looks like that in a few years' time we might have people that are really specialized in methodology. Uh, I don't know whether we are going to arrive to a point where we have a, a blind stati statistician when just receiving the data and analyzing the data. I don't know that. I don't think so because it's going to be expensive. But yeah, definitely in a few years' time uh, we all need a statistician in our, uh, on our side. Mm. Person will get promoted immediately without the publication of your uh, this, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, yeah. Mm. But still, now, for example, if you look at the CV of statisticians, they normally have very good publications. Uh, if you are good enough to be a good statistician, uh, I mean, you might appear in several, in several papers. Uh, I, I, I know colleagues and friends that. Uh, Good, very good CDs, and they participated in several experiments, several, sorry, several studies. Uh, they don't know anything about what they did, but they know just about the numbers, uh, and they are in several and several papers. Yeah, I agree. But in fact, they're actually, about that, sorry, I forgot. Uh, uh, there are some, some, many authors now that are suggesting that we should switch from authorship to contributorship. So. So switch the way we evaluate the work in, in such a way that, for example, uh, it's not important mm, that you were in the paper that is more relevant to what you did for the paper. So like whether you were writing, whether you were like, just running statistics, something that, for example, PLOS does, but those also other journals do like. Uh, uh, and then more complex things like evaluating also the, the contribution. Now think about, for example, this large replication efforts with hundreds and hundreds of authors running, I mean, uh, on the same paper. Uh, what's your role in the paper exactly? Of course, you are not an author any longer. You just contributed to the effort. So perhaps also in a few years, and, and this is something that, for example, the physicists started to do several decades ago. So if you look at these very large efforts, for example, collecting data in physics with groups which are uh, made of hundreds of authors, uh, we still have to understand the standard, but for example, st physics might be a good standard. Mm. So, other questions or issues? I think uh, we could also discuss person like in person uh, later on when we'll have uh, refreshments at the bar uh, here uh, at the Bartacus. I think that's it for, uh, it's also uh, the final uh, seminar for this year, so I want to thank uh, the audience, all the speakers, and uh, for, for the nice uh, discussions and uh, the attendance.